choosing the stock. First is how you create a superposition of, uh, of, an, of uh, specially separated states of an object, which is uh, considerably more uh, massive than uh, what people have done to date, okay? And uh, I'm a theorist, so these will be suggestions uh, for protocols, but uh, not too distant from what people can actually do. And then, uh, towards the end of the talk, okay, so that is, the, that is this matter with Ramsey and the mentioned part. Okay. Uh, then there is a, a more adventurous part, I should say, uh, towards the end, where we can, we will show that how uh, two such matter wave interferometers adjacent to each other can uh, enable us to probe whether gravity is quantum. Okay. The, you, can, you can design an experiment. And this experiment is a bit more in the, in the fashion of a, you know, a Bell state measurement, okay? a, a Bell inequality test okay? for quantum gravity. But, but let me start with uh, more, uh, by now, quite mundane aspects that you want to generate a superposition of specially uh, separated states. So the early proposals were kind of uh, when they were trying to do this, okay, so I, I myself also, you uh, did such a proposal using, uh, say, not and occupied states in a cavity, and uh, this radiation pressure that Miles spoke about, you know, radiation pressure pushes, say, the cavity mirror in an in a oscillating state when there is some photon in the cavity, no, no oscillations when there's no photon in a cavity, and so at intermediate times, some superposition is created, okay? Um, this is just Schrodinger's technique, right? So Schrodinger was, there was this, uh, you know, the, the radioactivity, okay? Decay or not, that's, that's the ancillary system. That's the, the bona fide microscopic system, which you know as quantum. And the one you want to investigate, which was the cat in this case, is, is the, the, the larger mechanical oscillator. So that technique, unfortunately, to be applicable requires a large coupling okay, between the, the microscopic system, which you can put in a superposition, and then you uh, couple it to a microscopic system, which goes to distinct states corresponding to it. The catch is that you require a large coupling. An unfortunate thing is optomechanical coupling is very low in strength till now, the, the, the kind of coupling at least which is required for this. Uh, there were cleverer ideas later on, okay? So, for example, you could use a different ancillary system with larger coupling, but then uh, other problems can come in that, uh, namely the, the decoherence of the, of the fields uh, of the, the ancillary quantum system. So somehow this kind of thing has not yet been uh, really performed, and, and the real reason is somehow that the coupling is, one of the reasons coupling not good enough, and the other reason is decoherence. However, uh, with feasible couplings, what this kind of does is a tiny superposition. So the, the, the important question is, if you were able to do this with the improvement of technology, one can get a bona fide quantum system, microscopic, I mean, there are lots of them now, and suppose one is able to couple, the, the question arises as how would you probe such a superposition? Okay. So these, these protocols, uh, you know, they, they kind of subscribes to the fact that this this microscopic system will entangle and disentangle periodically with the macroscopic system. And then just by probing this microscopic system, you, from, from the, the increase of its, uh, you know, mixedness or entropy with time, you could indirectly, uh, you know, infer that the macroscopic system was going to some kind of superposition at intermediate times. Okay. So an indirect way, just, just probing the, the ancillary system which prepares the superposition. However, the problem is that uh, someone might say, how do you know that it is only entangled with that and not the rest of the universe, right? So, so in fact, to uh, probe a quantum superposition, truly in this kind of setting, you would actually require to probe both the systems. And that is, that is also a problem in the Schrodinger kind of technique where you use an ancillary system to prepare the superposition.
And I think we have found, so the first part of the talk is how to probe these microscopic superpositions. Okay. Uh, we will um, borrow this idea from the, the word cow came up quite a few times in the, in the last talk, okay. Here I mean the Colella over her, 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 over her, over her, her Werner paper, which Miles suggested. And you can borrow their technique and and then if you prepare a superposition using an ancillary system and place them on the Earth's gravitational field or in any, any acceleration, then you will get a relative phase between the components, okay, as long as they are, they are feeling this acceleration. Uh, and, and that phase can be used, that phase can then map back to the ancillary system so that you can, you can really do a Ramsey interferometer. That's, that's the idea, okay? Let me go through more slowly, okay? Because this is, this is new work and this is um, what the my, uh, first part of my talk. So the setting is the following. We consider, so I, I work with a bunch of uh, experimentalists who levitate things, yeah? So uh, well, one of them is also around, uh, maybe not in the room at the moment, ah, Hendrik, okay? And, and a few others. Uh, so they, and, and you have had lots of talks regarding levitation recently, and you can, in principle, levitate a spinful object, okay? And, and one classic example is NV centers in diamond, okay? Uh, I understand that this, this also came up earlier in the, in the workshop. Uh, uh, and this NV center has three possible spin states, so if you put in a, a magnet, okay, Near, near this trapped object, this is optically trapped, assume. Uh, if you put up a magnet, then the opposite spin states are going to have shifted wells, okay? Just, just because the, of the, the inhomogeneous magnetic field, one spin component prefers to stay there, the other prefers to stay there. And then you can actually complete an interferometer, okay? We'll be, how the interferometer works will become uh, clear in the, in the subsequent slides. And because there's a difference in the heights, that, that's why we have this inclination, a, gravi a relative gravitational phase will occur between these, uh, these two states, the object, and that will feed back onto the relative phase between the spin states, which we will measure at the end of the interferometer. Okay? That's the, the basic idea. Okay? So, um, Now, uh, this is just the, the magnetic fields emanating from, from this magnet which is uh, placed nearby. So the only thing important is the magnetic field gradient here because it's the magnetic field gradient which couples the, the spin of the object to its center of mass motion. Okay. It, it, it's just like the stern gerlach effect. The magnetic field gradient couples the, the spin, spin to the motion and, and this is the the, the magnetic field uh, gradient at a, at a distance along the axis of the magnet, okay? In general, you will have, in general, you will have coupling in all the three directions, but these traps can be very tight in, along their axial direction so that effectively you have only a coupling in the Z direction. Okay. To couple this, uh, um, uh, the envy center spin, okay, to its center of mass motion. So we have this trapped nanocrystal with a spin embedded in it, and the spin is being coupled to the center of mass, okay, just as a giant atom would be in a stern garlock. So it's really, really like a stern garlock, only that it's now it's trapped in a harmonic well, okay. And this is the coupling. Again, we have borrowed ideas. So this kind of coupling of, of the magnet, of, of, uh, spin to uh, uh, the motion of a resonator is, is not new. So uh, uh, there were works back in 2008 by PRX group and also by Peter Rubble. And also in context of um, uh, simultaneously with us, there was this work by Tong Kang Lee on, on coupling the, the spin to the, the motion through the standard like effect. Okay. Now, what I want to really uh, say is the best is perhaps the, yeah, 
So this, this side explains the interferometer. So you have this uh, diamond and the center spin, okay? And this is the stan garlock coupling. The spin is coupled to the motion. And lambda is the magnetic field gradient, okay? So the larger the gradient, more the coupling, stronger the coupling between the spin and the motion. And this term is the gravitational potential. So the, the, this will be just mg into the height difference. Okay. So the height difference comes from the ground state spread into the, into the, you know, into the, 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 the amplitude of, of motion. Okay. So you can see that why this is mgh. The cos theta is there because of our inclination. Okay. Our inclination is the parameter which we use to freely change to do the fringes. Okay. An interferometer means you have, must have fringes. So the theta, so we want to make the G controllable to have the fringes, that's why we have it. Now what's happening? So you start, say, say consider start with an arbitrary coherent state, okay, uh, somewhere here. So that is this coherent, let's go at the left top in this well, but is somewhat here in this well. Okay. So in, for the Z equal to minus option, this rolls like this, comes back. For the Z equal to plus option, it rolls like this and comes back. Okay. So an arbitrary coherent state, you can even think of a thermal state. A thermal state is, after all, a collection of random coherent states. So whatever the coherent state for plus well, for one well, it will do like this, come back to its original after one time period. For the other well, it will do like this and come back. So you have a natural interferometer due to the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. You do not need to do anything actively okay, to complete the interferometer. The harmonic oscillator dynamics makes the interference and brings it back. When, when this is brought back, okay, then, then what happens? When this is brought back, both the spatial components overlap, right? And when both the spatial components overlap, then you can, the, it gets disentangled essentially and you can measure the spin and infer this gravitational phase difference. And that, from that, you can infer that there must have been a superposition okay, which accumulated this gravitational phase. But the spin alone cannot do it. The spin alone will not sens be sensitive to the Earth's g, small g. Okay. okay, so this is how the interferometer uh, works. So first, you start with a coherent state of the of, the, of the, the center of mass of the object and uh, the, the diamond envy center in SZ equal to zero state. This is a state to which you can very well initialize the, the, the diamond envy center. At time t equal to zero, you apply a, a pulse to create a superposition of plus one and minus one. As soon as you have this pulse, okay, and you, then you have this dynamics I was talking about, after the pulse, where for z equal to plus one and minus one, you have this oppositely oscillating center of masses. That is the dynamics for plus one and minus one. And there is this additional gravitational phase sheet that accumulates that has been not been shown here because of the different heights. Okay. <clears throat> then at time, at, at the final, final time, the, the, this phase shift, the gravitational phase shift accumulates solely between the spin states. So that's the end of your Ramsey interferometer. So you can, all you have done is only initialize the spin, created a superposition of the spin, and then finally you measure the spin. You never talk, uh, never try to see the center of mass moving at all, but because the phase the Ramsey phase accumulated is something which can only happen if you have a spatially separated uh, superposition of the, the center of mass. You can conclude that the center of mass must have been superposed. And this will allow you to infer really tiny superpositions because it's very difficult to really apply a Ramsey phase to one part of a superposition as opposed to the other, okay, if it is as um, separated by as small a distance as, as will be in this case. Okay. So uh, for example, I have shown it here. The kinds of masses they trap 
uh, tend to the power minus 17 kg, what, what they regularly do, okay, if in, in 100 kilohertz traps, then typically the separation that happens due to this magnetic field gradient is of the order of a picometer. And for a picometer superposition, you cannot take a field and give a relative phase to one arm of the interferometer opposed to the other. But gravity does it very naturally for you. So the, 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 the Colella idea was, was very useful here. And you can get an order of unity of phase if you hold the superposition for a microsecond. That, that's what we use there, okay, in a, in a magnetic field gradient of 10 to the power 4 Tesla. Per. That, that, these are, the, these are the, the requirements. And of the order of unity means you can get the full oscillations. Then you change your theta. And, and you, you get the interferometer pattern. Right, and, and how do you finally measure it? This is just to wrap up the, the thing that you, you just measure the probability of the plus one plus minus one to come back to zero in a pulse, okay? So you're just always just measuring and preparing the internal states. And then this is your ranges. <clears throat> now, of course, there was a problem. Uh, that that there uh, that can be good as a first experiment of of of, uh, of a trapped object, but it will not probe any of these uh, uh, alternatives that have been proposed to quantum theory, such as you know GRW or collapse or CSL. For those, you really need large superpositions. So this is really a tiny superposition. You can always go to larger objects and make the superposition ever more tiny. But what I've shown is that however ever more tiny, you can still probe the superposition principle. Uh, so one should not always assume a priori some theory to test or verify. Uh, so if you want to just verify the, the, the question, does, uh, is a really massive object quantum mechanics? Okay. Then you are not so worried about the scale of the superposition. You just want to verify whether the superposition principle holds. And that purpose will be solved by the first line of experiment. Okay, when the superposition is tiny, it becomes tinier as you more, go, go more massive. But nonetheless, you can do exactly an interferometry because of the gravitational phase difference. But we would also like to improve things to go to larger and larger superpositions. Okay, then, then one can really try to uh, you know, test some of the unconventional now, for that, what we needed is to liberate the objects. Okay, this is again, again, we are borrowing ideas from some places because liberating the objects is not original either. So, Oriol Romez Reissert and Ignacio Sirac and others <coughs> proposed that you can, uh, for if you let things really fall and somehow you have created a superposition, then, then you, can, you can really increase distances. And, and not only that, even Marcus Armstrong that you heard, okay, it's, 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 it's a free flight interferometer. So Henry Kulbricht, who is an expert in that, we got together with him and we think uh, we have a scheme where you can actually liberate and, and increase the distance. What is, what is uh, constraining us in the previous uh, thing to a picometer distance is that the object as, as a, is both the good and bad there, okay? So the good is that it comes back for the interference, but the bad is, of course, it's limited to within the harmonic wealth. Okay? On the other hand, if you let it go, it will go farther. Okay? So we just use the stern garlock effect, okay? Instead of a silver atom, we have a large atom like that. So we have a spin inside, inhomogeneous magnetic field. It starts accelerating, okay? At Certain times, at time tau by four, okay, we, we flip the spin, then it starts decelerating. Okay. Decelerating and then it will come to a turning point, turn back and start accelerating. Then at time three tau by four, we flip the spin again. Okay. Then it starts decelerating. So we need two spin flips to have this free particle <coughs> interferometer. Now, now it is not confined to a well, it can go to as much distance as it wants, as, as much time as is allowed by coherence of the internal state, <coughs> and of course the spatial central mass state to fly. And you are, what you're doing is you are doing and undoing a Stern-Garlock experiment. This is the 
the doing of the stern garlic, this is the undoing of the stern garlic. Now, we were not sure that this kind of scheme would be very uh, robust, have, have the nice robustness features of the previous scheme. The previous scheme has very nice robustness features that you can start from a thermal state. And, uh, yeah? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, we, we flip the spin twice, okay? By an external pulse, you have to flip that spin once here to start decelerating and then it accelerates, goes opposite, and then to flip again to decelerate to come back. Okay. So, you know, so this is a stern garlic effect. So this is stern garlic happening, okay? And <coughs> you have to finish the interferometer. You have to, you have to let it expand and come back. Of course, it's very difficult to practically change an external magnetic field direction. So that's why we changed flip the spin. But what is subtle is you have to do it twice in this flip like case. Because just bringing back the spatial components is not enough. They can physically come back, but they'll have opposite momentum. So they will be orthogonal. So to complete the Ramsey interferometry, because you only want to measure the spin, you actually have to bring you have to slow down and make, make these packets come exactly overlap. Okay. Then you disentangle the space from the spin and you can measure the phase from the spin. So, so this is why we do the following thing. So first you have this magnetic field, up accelerates this way, down accelerates this way. At time tau by four you flip. Okay, this is the exact pattern in space and this is in time. It starts slowing down, turns back and starts accelerating. But if we let it accelerate, they would pass each other, but they would have opposite momenta states. So by measure, the spin is not disentangled. Up spin with plus spin, down spin with minus spin. Okay? That's why we have the another pulse, okay? Slows down and you finish your interferometer. But what is good about this scheme is now, whatever initial state it started with, for every initial state, you have done the acceleration, deceleration to bring back exactly to the original state. Right? So it will work also for a thermal state. This, this thing, this is something which we were not sure before we, we did the thing, that for a harmonic oscillator, the harmonic oscillator dynamics, you know, promised that you would come, come back, a coherent state would always come back irrespective of the initial state. But for a free flight, we were not sure, but I mean, I've told you the logic, it's, it's very clear. Each packet on each arm will expand in the same way Okay, so, so essentially, same thing will happen to both if you, if you just do the same acceleration, deceleration to the center of mass. And you just bring them back to overlapping wave packets, and then you would be having this situation. Now, following this kind of scheme, we can actually... Uh, okay, so we actually proposed in the paper to do this in an incline, again using the gravitational uh, you know, potential difference to give a phase shift, but perhaps in a, in, a, in a scheme where you have a sufficiently large separation, you don't need gravity to provide the phase difference. You, you might have some field gradient, which will other, some different field gradient, like a, like a um, you know, um, electric field offered by light, uh, which will be offer a relative phase. But again, just to, the, the scheme is there, so you have a spin flip once, so first they are trying to opposite, you have a spin flip, they start coming back, you do a spin flip again, and then they, they decelerate and come back to the exactly the same original state, apart from wave packet spreading, yeah, but, but they have spread the same way, so they overlap, and the spin disentangles. And uh, then this is the, these are the distances, this is the gravitational phase shift, and this is the deep distance. Okay. You, can, <coughs> you can mathematically understand why T cube, okay? We are accelerating, so this, this part here is the acceleration of the NV, okay? Acceleration T square, A T square is the distance, okay? And then, M in at square, uh, square is distance, and the M from the, this had the M from below the, the you know, F by M have canceled, okay? So it was MG into, you know, the, the distance. So the, the, and 
another time because that's the integration time for the collection of the phase. That's why you have this TQ. And what effectively happens is that for a 10 to the power 10 AMU mass, you can in principle get to a superposition of states separated by 100 nanometers. I'm not an expert on, I, I don't know much about Colas model, but Henrik told us that this would be a good thing to aim for. 100 nanometers superpositions for 10 to the power 10 AMU objects, then we will uh, possibly see, see new physics. Um, and uh, what is the price to, everything has a price, okay? So what is the price we paid for that? This requires very high magnetic field radiance. Okay, so we, this, 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 you can about 10 AMU and 100 nanometers, superposition requires 10 to the power seven Tesla per meter. Have been achieved over very small distances, but, but not there. So we, if we go for lower, so if we go for one, degree, one order less, we'll get 10 nanometers. Two orders less, we'll get one nanometer. But these are still spectacular compared to the one picometer which was there in the, in the trapped object. So that, that would all, all be interesting, this uh, the free flight way. <coughs> now compared to other free flight interometer, uh, interferometers like the ones which have been proposed from you know, Innsbruck and Munich, uh, is that, or, or even the ones which uh, uh, people like Henry, Marcus Hahn tried to do, is that here it is RAM C. So you only measure the speed. You never care about the spatial thing. You just conclude about the spatial thing from the something which could, could happen only to the, some phase which will accumulate only to the spatial state and has now accumulated on the speed because in the intermediate times it was intact. So that's, that's, the, that's the only difference. Okay, so I come to the most adventurous part of the talk and actually this uh, is uh, still being written up and I, I, I tend, I would like to say to people that it's not work in progress but every time some new question comes and it becomes a work, it becomes a work in, work in progress. But I will, I will, I will, I will tell you, so, so it's something which we are writing up for um, like more than a year now but some new issue always arises, so we have to go back and think again, and, and we sort that out. But let us let, let me try to start very theoretically and schematically. Consider the fact that somehow you have been able to uh, prepare two uh, two matter wave uh, you know interferometers okay, um, next to each other and create two superpositions. Um, I call them left and right, okay? So just, it's dichotomic, okay? You have, and consider that you can actually hold this, okay? Uh, for a time. How to hold this, I'll, I'll come later. I'm not going to a explicit scheme immediately. In a few slides, I will do that. But suppose you can hold, so that's why the held is italic. Suppose you hold two macroscopic superpositions steadily. One is left plus right, the other is left plus right. This could be created due to the, the kind of interferometer I was talking about, but I will go to the explicits a bit later. <laughs> now also consider that they interact only through the gravitational interaction. This is very challenging to fulfill, but again I will, I will tell you towards the end how this is done. But consider for the moment there's no electromagnetic interaction, this only gravitational interaction I then what happens? So the state in each interferometer is left plus right, left plus right initially. Okay. However, if you expand out, you will see there are components where the masses are closer, where the components where the masses are further, and they will all acquire different phases due to the Newtonian gravitational interaction. People typically have this idea in their subconscious that this is very low, but that's not because of the H crossing the denominator, okay? So it's not that low. It's still low, far lower than if you had two charges at that point, I mean, 10 to the power 30 order low, but you have to ensure 
Of course, that there are no other interactions. But then these are these phases occurring. Okay? And these phases are purely due to the Newtonian gravitational interaction. Now, I have just uh, rewritten the maths a little bit. Okay? I have taken some of the phases common. You know, the phase when the both masses are towards the right of their interferometer, or both masses are towards the left of their interferometers, is exactly the same. So you can take that out. And then, if you rewrite this thing, you will see that these uh, coefficients of L1 and R1, okay, with these extra phases, those will become orthogonal if this delta phi LR plus delta phi RL is pi. So if the sum of these two acquired phases, phase differences, okay, delta phi RL and delta phi LR is pi, then the complements of L1 and R1 are orthogonal, which is a maximally entangled state of two qubits. Okay, here, what is the qubit here? Here is like an orbital qubit, LR, LR, positional qubit. So maximally entangled state of two orbital qubits yeah, reminds you of Bell's inequalities. Okay, so this entanglement can be verified if you can generate that maximally entangled state through a simple Bell inequality. This is the idea, okay? Now let me go to a bit more explicit details. Okay? So just to convince you that this is not entirely hopeless, uh, let's consider the situation when these masses, the closest approach, okay? So, you know, when one R1, L2 is the closest approach case, is much smaller than the spatial distance of the individual superpositions. Okay? So you have managed to create individual superpositions which are far longer than the closest approach of the masses. Then all the phases except the phi RL are negligible. Okay? The denominator is just too large. Okay? So you have this G M1 M2 tau by H cross by the, the closest separation distance. This turns out to be not too bad, and that's the thing. Now, what, what I mean by not too bad is, will be varying enormously between theorists and experimentalists and from person to person, okay? But what I mean by not too bad is this thing at the, these numbers at the bottom here. So if you take 10 to the power minus 14 kg, so this will be micrometer dimension spheres. There is some work in trapping microspheres. So people trap them in ion traps now. Of course, ion traps will not at all, we should be very clear of that okay, because we don't want the electromagnetic field. Uh, in, in optical traps also, it is, is difficult, but people try. But there are also these diamagnetic traps, I understand, for diamond envies, okay, because this is a good diamagnet, apparently. The, the diamond, so you can you can trap it, and you will need for this you will need completely cryogenics. Okay, so the earlier parts of the, the thing I was talking about room temperature, but trapped, you know, optically trapped things. But here you will have to have these objects coming from uh, probably from diamagnetic traps of the objects cooled to tens of millikelvin temperatures, okay. and. <laughs> So, the, but, but the mass, you need microspheres, okay, microspheres. If you take microspheres, so previous one was uh, three orders of magnitude less in mass, okay. So we are going three orders of magnitude more in mass than what has been trapped. But actually, you know, in, in optical trap, people have gone far larger than microspheres. But just that we want this cooled, okay, and not necessarily in the ground state. I'm calling of the internal cooling here. We, we do not necessarily require a ground state of motion, but we require the internal things to be cool. And we have to keep the problem. So, so this paper was almost being written up. And I gave a talk end of September in, in Benaske, in, the, in a largely experimental audience of, of these trappers. And what came up, unfortunately, was that Casimir course, is something which we had, uh, you know, uh, did, did not uh, think that they will be there at, at the kind of separation. So we were doing 
the thing with my micron separations. Okay? But app, and, and or, or if you talk, talk to an experimentalist, often they will tell one micron, maybe Kasimi is not there. But people who know, there was this guy, Andrew Gerachi, who knows about these things. Uh, actually, it is hundreds of microns, unfortunately. Okay. And not hundreds. So, so 100 micron, at 100 micron separation, the Kasimi force is negligible compared to gravity. Okay. But even at you know, one order, so 10 micron separation is far larger than gravity. This is a different one by R dependence. So you need to separate by 100 microns. In, order, in other words, you need to be safely at a separation where Newton's law has been verified very reliably. Okay? So you have that kind of separation. <coughs> but what demand it places on the superposition is that at least that must be comparable as well. That's the problem. I told earlier that this is larger compared to the separation. That we won't even aim. In practice, we will aim to just create an equal superposition. That also suffices. But that means that we have to clear a hundred micron separation. So just think what I, I was telling that this uh, 100 nanometers was stretching the magnetic field gradients, right? But <clears throat> what can we do? Okay. So we utilize the fact that spin coherences are going up. Okay. And that nuclear spin is, is very coherent. But just, uh, just a brief pause in the middle, uh, that if we, if we do verify that, what we will learn about the gravitational field, okay, my, forgive my horrible drawing there, those are field lines, okay, those arrows, okay. So what will we learn? This phase has accumulated, okay, means that such a configuration was steadily held without decoherence for some time, okay. Such a configuration, different field configurations must have been held in a coherent superposition for a time for those phases to accumulate. So it will prove that the, the gravitational field was, fields, different configurations can be in a coherent superposition. Okay. I have put coherent state levels there for the field for, for uh, I won't go into that. So yeah, it might become clear at the end why it is, we, we just can just say field configurations for the moment. Okay. But this is how we are planning to do this and how to avoid all those complications. It's not that it is all doable tomorrow, but I'm hoping, I have to ask people like Hendrik, but maybe 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but, but, but it's not, it's not the, it, it is not something which we require galactic technology to do. So that's, that's, that's the issue. <clears throat> okay, now this interferometer looks a bit different from the one I showed earlier, okay? You see, so we, first of all, we use the best possible spin coherence time, okay? Which is for NV electronic spins, we can stretch it and think it's 100 milliseconds. Okay? People in, in bulk NV, people have reached things like 600 milliseconds with dynamical decoupling, okay? Uh, where you flip the spin. That is very bad for us because the, the uh, the, okay, so I, I, I should tell one important thing, that uh, there was another open question that this Bell correlation that we want to verify is very difficult to verify between special, uh, you know, special uh, uh, orbitals, okay, because you have to have another way of undoing the superposition. But what happens is if we do it in the stern garlock way, as I was saying, it all maps back to the spins. So the gravitationally neutron interaction mediated entanglement goes into a entanglement with, with the two, the spins of the two NV centers. So all you have to do is a Bell inequality test between the spins of the two NV centers. And Bell inequality test with the NV center is very famous and topical at the moment because of the recent loophole free Bell inequalities there. So the Bell, Bell test will here not, is not, designed to test non-locality, but here it is designed to witness the quantum nature of gravity. Okay. Because without a quantum mediator, you cannot get entanglement between these quantum systems. Okay. To have a quantum entanglement between two systems, you necessarily have to have a quantum mediator propagating wave. So if you verify a Bell inequality between the spins, you will, uh, time is up, right? <laughs> so then, then you will verify this uh, gravitationally induced entanglement. 
the only thing I wanted to tell here is we also map to nuclear spins. So we, we accelerate for a brief while, we map to nuclear spins, then we can let the superposition propagate for a long time, okay? Then we map back to electronic spins to decelerate, let them fall next to each other for some time. Then we map back to electronic spins, we bring back. Okay. So because the nuclear spins give us the time, yeah, time to integrate. And uh, essentially, uh, you verify that something was a current mediator. <clears throat> now, if you go to the, the low energy effective field theory that Miles was mentioning due to Donahue and others, he told towards the end of his talk that you could map it to a model where the, the local number of a Fox state interacts with the displacement operator of the, you know, of, of the gravitational background, okay? So here the, the BKs are the gravitational modes of the space and the, uh, the AJ, AJs are, are the, the, the A, A, A1, A, um, so A1 and A2 are the two number of operators for the two masses and sigma stands for the left or right mode. Okay, so I've discretized momenta here in writing that. Not the momenta of the, of, the, the, of the center of mass of the object, but I have not discretized the, the gravitational background that has the K in it. So if you solve that dynamics, and this dynamics has been done before in optomechanics, so we can very easily solve it, the Newtonian potential is, comes up from that term actually. But the gravitational field states end up in coherent states. Now, you know, there's good reason to believe that at low energy effective field theory, um, you know, will be the correct theory to which any quantum gravity theory should reduce at, at low energies. Then the implication is that you have a superposition of distinct coherent states if you get, uh, is possible for the gravitational field if you get an entanglement between the spins of these two masses after the interference has formed, okay? which you can verify by a Bell test. I have put the question mark on this distinct because the subtlety is that, you know, the phase is being acquired between the, those states, the, this sum over sigma, sigma dashed, okay, the particle being here, 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 okay. Those are the four sum over sigma, sigma dashed. So I've taken, Unlike Miles, I've taken Fox states to be the, the particle here and there, okay? So the huge mass being created here or here, okay? And to have a coherent superposition between that, you need, uh, you know, you need these to be very low amplitude, overlapping amplitudes. And that is the case. These, if you calculate these displacements, because there's the, the you know, H cross CK in the denominator, I have not put the C there. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's very low amplitude. These, these, these coherent states are almost overlapping with each other. At the same time, they are coherent states. So it's a bit slippery to identify what aspect of the quantum, what quantum aspect of the gravitational field is being used, but definitely you need quantum states, coherent states. And superpositions of not so distinct coherent states. Um, yeah, I would like to, Okay, uh, we have one minute, so one quick question maybe. Yeah. yeah. Could be a problem of the interaction between the spins at this distance of 100 mi uh, yeah, microns. It's, it's, it's negligible for 100 microns. Okay. It was even negligible for when we were doing with one micron. Your problem with the, I'm sorry, regarding your problem with the Casimir uh, yeah. force that seems to be the major impediment in, in, in your experiment. Yeah. I just thought that this force will be proportional to area, so it will scale differently with the size of the object. Yeah. So perhaps you could do this experiment with several objects and see how, mm. how things scale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those are all, all things we try to think. I mean, uh, it's, it's very difficult to come up with a quick solution that way. I mean, the different spatial dependences one could use. The problem is one doesn't even know the Casimir very well. Uh, 
uh, it hasn't been very so so it is we are taking for the moment we are it, it's a very good suggestion for the moment we are taking the safest approach just to keep out of course we are making the the, the superposition very demanding there what you have said is is the main route to the future but perhaps one can uh, you know use the different dependencies of those forces to make the experiment less demanding in terms of superpositions okay so uh, let's thank the speaker and break for tea.